Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Literacy View. As always, we really love our special guests, and um, Kata Solo is no exception. We're so happy to have her with us today. Uh, Kata is, let me just see, she is the Executive Director of the Goyan Foundation, where she led its multi-year transformation process and created the Goyan Literacy Fellowship to recognize exceptional reading teachers. She is a former classroom educator, school administrator, and field organizer. And she recently wrote an article uh, entitled Comprehensive Reading Curricula and Teacher Expertise. We don't have to choose. And that came out on November 30th. And it was with the Shanker Institute. So, Kata, this was such a, a terrific article. Judy and I just loved it. And we just had an episode about curriculum. And so uh, this was a perfect one to add to, um, into the repertoire. So you had said in the article that what you're seeing now is curriculum champions versus the teacher defenders. I love that term. Please start right there. Tell us what that means and then we'll, we'll take it from there. Awesome. Um, and first, thank you guys so much for for having me having me on tonight. I was just saying before before the recording started, um, you, you I listen to your listen to your podcast all the time, um, and you've been just knocking it out of the park these I think, last you. couple last couple of months, um, especially um, the between you know Pam, Pamela Stowe and Nell Duke and and Doctor and Doctor Path. Um, just some of my absolute favorite podcast episodes. Um, and, and and I also just really appreciate too how you all are actual reading practitioners and teachers. And I I I wanna I'd love I love I would love to see just more 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 folks following in your footsteps in central oh. teacher, teacher voice. So I you you all are doing something really special and I think unique in this space. So thanks so much for having thank me. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And and for the nice the nice things you just said. Um, but to go to talk about to go to the to go to that to that that dichotomy a little bit. Yeah. So I wrote this article um, really based on just observations I've made about sort of the the this this current this current stage in the in the literacy conversation. Um, it it seems to me that like a lot of a lot of folks are really talking talking past each other um, and talking past each other unnecessarily. Um, there, you know, I think because of all of these laws that have recently been been passed that you guys have talked about on this on this very very on, on this very podcast, right? Forty six states have passed laws about reading instruction, and you know, and 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 while I think the media coverage is really focused on on foundational skills and phonics, that you know the actual legislation has gone it goes go, goes a lot deeper and is focusing on mandating certain curricula or forbidden forbidding certain curricula, and that's and that's opened up um, I think some really like tough and difficult conversations about about what those curricula are um, and what the role of teachers are in um, in in implementing the this um, these 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 new these brand brand new programs and it's and it's caused this real real conflict where where the the fight becomes about whether or not there should be we we should be implementing these curricula um, instead of getting into the the details of the the implementation yeah so you know something um Judy and I have had this conversation um Judy always goes back to Maureen Ruby and so um Judy you remember when we spoke to Maureen how she said there's no perfect curriculum there's no perfect program out there and so in the article when Kata said um call it the curriculum champions versus the teacher defenders. You know, I think you're in the field, I'm in the field. 
How do you think teachers at this point feel about, um, you know, changing the curriculum and are they part of this conversation at all? Or is it just kind of like, look, here's the curriculum, here's the box, you know, um, what are some of your thoughts about that as far as teachers' um, feelings? And, you know, I know you you have to be careful. You're in a school right now. But I'm talking about the general feeling, not just your school. It's funny when you say this about the box. You made me think about Lucky Charms, the cereal. You never know what you're going to get. <laughs> but... um. And that's kind of the way it is a little bit with some of the tasks in curriculum. And I've been talking about that. I think in terms of curriculum and how teachers are feeling in general, I mean, you could go on Facebook, you could go on the groups. There's definitely a learning curve for a lot of teachers right now. And, you know, teachers don't have an endless amount of time in their days, right? Lesson planning, because a lot of these curriculums don't write the lesson. They just give you the content and then you still have to go write a lesson. Then um, very often there's tasks included. Sometimes the tasks seem to align to the standards. Sometimes they don't seem as well aligned. Sometimes the tasks seem like they're not something that the kids are able to do developmentally. And um, a lot of principles like differentiation, right? Um, that takes time and a lot of thought. and. There's a learning curve. Some teachers are, you know, in different places in their journey in the science of reading. You know, some people have been on this journey like I have for seven or eight years. Some some have been on it like you have for what? For like 20 years, Faith? Over. Yeah. Right. right. And some for some people, it's just their first year. And, you know, their ratings and evaluations are happening now. And I think teachers in general very often feel like they need to be perfect because I think a lot of teachers in general are perfectionists. They want to do really well, but it's really hard when there's a learning curve. And it's really hard when some of these tasks are in this box and you're like, hmm, does it really align with the science? Did the researchers look at every task? So, you know, I think there's definitely a learning curve for a lot of people right now. And I think that we must be compassionate. Yeah. Yeah. So, Kate, Judy brought up a good point about, um, you know, how certain parts of these programs um, don't really play out well in the classroom. Maybe when they tested the program and it went through maybe a lab classroom, it worked under certain conditions. But then you take that same program and now it's real life. Mm -hmm. And they're given this program and it doesn't translate into what's expected. Could you talk a little bit about that since the Goyan Foundation does, that's the job of it, is to try to capture um, research-based practices in the classroom, in real time with teachers. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the the when when I kind of went down my own, like I went on my own science of reading journey, right? Like I think it's, I I realized, right, that the, the I, I think I, I, I quickly like got a handle on like, I think the, the basic, you know, the basic theories and like the cognitive science that that, that undergirds, undergirds, you know, the science, the science of reading, right? But what 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 I what I really struggled with though as a former secondary school educator, I've never I've never worked with elementary school students. I really struggled to imagine what what this theory looked like in practice. There and there simply were not videos. There were simply not examples that were readily accessible for me to sit down and and watch and and learn from. And that really that so that that motivated me. And motivated the foundation to try to try to start very very slowly and carefully and and thoughtfully and we're not very big so that, um, I want to I want to emphasize that to attempt to to attempt to fill to fill that gap so I work every single day I work with 
literacy experts, and, and by literacy experts, I mean reading teacher, reading teachers who are literacy experts across the country. And I work with them so that and help them capture what their what they're teaching and what their actual practice looks like so that other teachers can have can have models and can have actual like real examples to to, to learn from. Um, I think, you know, I, I, I think teachers for the most part, most teachers I know are so, 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 so curious about the science of reading, but they don't have, they don't have good professional development. They don't have good resources. And so they're stuck and they're frustrated because they're hearing from on high, right? That like, you need to change your practice. You're doing it all wrong, but no one's actually showing them what, what this can look like in practice and what this should look like. And the other thing is, I think it, 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 it doesn't look like just one thing either, right? It's not just, and it's, and it's not just foundational skills. Um, it's so much, it's so much, it's so much more than that. And, and they're certainly not great examples of, you know, of, of third graders having like a rich, you know, discussion about a text that really matters. Um, you know, there's there there are no there, there there are no videos of Socratic seminars online um, of of you know of 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 fourth graders talking about like talking about walk two moons or something something like that. Um, there's just there are not enough examples out there, and that that's a real that and that and that lack of examples that that's what really motivates our work. Yeah, I mean, I. I have to tell you, I love, love what you're doing. And I think it's really important work. Judy, um, in the article, Kata uh, mentioned, and, and she said it this way, curriculum implementation only works if teachers are on board. Would you agree, disagree? What are some of your thoughts about that statement? Curriculum implementation only works if teachers are on board. I think it's definitely helpful. And I think that most teachers have reached the point that they knew something had to change, right? It's frustrating um, implementing a program that's not producing great results. And I think that's what was going on. I know um, definitely in New York City, but nationwide that, you know, the data was very low for a very long time. I mean, I started teaching. I know we've spoken about this before in 2000. And um, the data's been low on state tests. Sometimes I'm seeing 30% pass rates, 38% pass rates, 55 if you're lucky, that's low. And, you know, I think that, you know, it was time, but I think it's also like teachers just want to be successful. And I think that, you know, all the studies that I'm reading and things online, that change takes time. And seeing um, data shifts sometimes will take some time. I, I think I've read sometimes it takes like four to five years to get to the point that you want to. Yes. So I think it's going to take a lot of patience. But also, I just wanted to know, is there a lot of research behind the whole concept of differentiation of tasks? Because one thing that I... I know if you're differentiating and doing a whole bunch of tasks in an explicit classroom where there's structured literacy, doesn't that now require additional modeling, which could yeah. take more time? Any yeah. thoughts about that? Oh, I mean, I think I, I think that's a that's a huge I think that's a, a huge issue, right? We're not just talking about foundation, particularly when we're talking about these more comprehensive curricula. Um, we're not just talking about foundational skills, right? We're not just talking about decoding. The professional development needs to needs there needs to be professional development about vocabulary, about vocabulary, right? About what a what a good fluency routine looks like. How do you lead a how do you lead a, a, a full class discussion, right? About a complex text. Um, those are those are I think just like just like learning anything new, right? Like. Teacher, if, if if these are if these are new things that teachers are doing, they need explicit modeling. Um, and I think I think one of my takeaways from you know from from all the reporting that's you know coming coming out about coming out um, about like implementation in New York is that 
that modeling isn't there. Um, it's partly because the I think coaches are not that if, if, if schools are lucky enough to have to have coaches, the coaches themselves are learning the curriculum for the first time, right? And alongside the teachers. And it's I, I mean, I, I would imagine I'm not a literacy coach, but I know I know you all may have some experience in that department. It's really, really, really hard to 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 teach as you're learning something for the first time yourself. Um and um I think yeah. it's a I think it's a huge, I think it's a huge problem. And I think it's it's really, it's also really sad to me because it feels like this if we don't get this implementation right whether that's in new york or los angeles or washington dc or where, wherever wherever it is this, this is this i worry that we're going to see just another pendulum swing in three to five years that's yeah we've that's been talking problem. about that yes definitely you know um you you mentioned about coaching while the teachers are learning that's what we did in reading first I mean, we were sent to Albany once a month and then we would have to bring it back to the school districts and just turnkey what we were learning. And so, um, and even if we were experienced teachers, it still was very new putting this all together. So um, what you're saying is exactly right. And Judy, you just got that HMH um, program and you were charged with having to, you know, learn it and help teachers at the same time, which is well, quite one fun. of the interesting things is, you know, and I, I, you know, I don't judge anybody and I still do work for New York City. One of the hardest parts in dealing with all of it was a lot of us coaches, we were cut and um, we worked for Central, but now we don't work for Central. Some people still do work for Central. Some people are like HMH specialists now. But it's not, you know, coaching in the way that it was before, where there was like usually one coach in a building getting full time support or maybe a coach supporting two schools. Co the coaching model looks very different now. A lot of the co my coach friends now became interventionists that are working with kids. So where does that leave the teachers? Are they getting enough? Are they getting enough level of support? I guess, you know, we got to talk to more teachers out there and ask them how they're feeling. I mean, you know, we had the guy from Chalkbeat, Alex Zimmerman, talk to yeah. some teachers, but I definitely think teacher voice is very important. And I wonder how much people are listening to the teachers and what they're going through, um, because the demands are great. And Faith, I was just wondering, so I mentioned before that topic of differentiation, right? Mm -hmm. um, is there a lot of science to support, like, differentiated mm -hmm. tasks for students? That's a great question. That's a great question. So here's the thing. When something is scripted, what makes it evidence-based is the idea that you are following it with a level of fidelity. Right. On the oh, other hand- Oh, the F word. The, the F, F word. word. Right, the F word. And so now- but that does not provide really latitude or decision-making on the part of the teacher, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's like, I don't think this was ever really talked about enough, quite honestly. That's a great question. Because if you start getting a little creative and deciding, well, you know what? I don't think this is working. Let me pull this out or let me change this or adjust, which you would hope because the teacher has a brain, but then does that ruin the whole evidence base of a program? So I'm gonna turn that over to you, Kata, since you are now watching and observing this, um, you know, what say you? <laughs> Yeah, I, so I think this is something. Again, I think this is this the, this F word, right? This this fidelity word, and I would put like the you know the word like script in this. Or I love that we have the F bomb going on tonight. <laughs> I, I I I love it too, and it's it's oh it's 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 such a. I, I think that's something I think this is something we really need to we need to we need to talk about more right like I think if you are a brand new a brand new teacher you know who's 22 and who's never you know set foot in a classroom before except maybe outside some some student teaching right 
a, you know, a, a scripts, scripts are probably good for that, are good for that teacher, right? Like, and I think, I think, and, and I certainly would have benefited from that when I was, I guess, 21 and setting foot in the classroom for the, for the same time, right? And I think we need to, and I think this is a, this is, this is something I want to be, or this is, I want to be very clear about what I believe. I think we need to have that kind of structure for, for our teachers. Um, but, but, and it's, and it's a big, and this is, I think this is a really, really big, but I, I think that we also need to hold space for teachers who are bringing expertise and knowledge of their particular context to, to modify right and to deviate from from those from those scripts like i see and and from that from that like from that scripted curriculum right i see i see curriculum as like the ground floor right it's going to make inexperienced or struggling teachers right it's going to make them probably a little bit better um but for but for expert teachers for seasoned teachers for teachers who know how to how to teach kids how to read if they're sticking to these scripts, it's probably going to ultimately hold them back. And it's also just a real, it sends this, I think, really problematic message that I think, Faith, you just alluded to, that teachers are robots. And all we need to do is, you know, program in, program in a curriculum or a script and set and set them loose. And that will, that will fix all of these, these reading problems we're having. That's not, that, that's a, that's a really, if I'm a classroom teacher, that's that's a terrible message for me to receive. It's telling me that like I don't matter, my knowledge doesn't matter, my expertise doesn't matter, my relationships with my students, my knowledge that you know the knowledge, my my knowledge of our community doesn't matter. I think that's a that's I think that's really a really counterproductive message. And what I would love to see, and and I also want to be clear, I'm. Judy, I'm, I'm not a I'm not a fan. It sounds like you're you're adopting into into reading and in, in, at your school is that? Oh no, well yeah, well yeah. Most of the schools in uh, many many schools we there's, are three, there's yeah. three curriculums that New York City had yeah. to choose from. One right. was with wisdom, wisdom, one was yeah. expeditionary learning, and the other one was HMH. A majority of schools uh chose HMH. We, there's some theories as to why, but like I said, I'm not in a high yeah. management position i'm just in the field in the trenches so you're not a fan why well i'm not i'm not a fan of i'm not a fan of into i'm not a fan of into reading of, of that of that hmh program because it it i mean having having looked at it briefly like it and and so i i should i i want i should i should caveat this i mean it's just it, it contains everything but the kitchen sink, right? It's so bloated, right? I'm 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 sure you you all are familiar with the term that it, basil basil bloat. It's just got mm -hmm. it's got it's got every everything in there. It doesn't really make it doesn't make good use of of, of authentic texts that matter, which I think is which I think is something that is really really important. That's not really what we're talking about uh, talking about here tonight. But when I look at curricula that I have a lot of respect for, like Wit and Wisdom and and EL Education, um, the other the other the other two on the uh, the other two on that list, I would love I I I, I like those curricula a lot. But I would love to see I would love to see the folks who are writing those curricula step back for a second and say, okay, like you know, here are the, here are the things about this, about this, these curricula that we don't want you teachers to change, but here are the things that you can change and you should change and you should think about, and you, and, and, and we're going to give you some permission to deviate. And then we're going to give you some examples of how other teachers across the country are modifying, modifying our, our, our curricula and making them better for, for students. I would love curriculum companies to be brave enough to do that. And I think it would really help with implementation and buy-in if they could bring themselves to acknowledge how important teacher expertise is. Well, you know something, um, listening to you, I do think that um, you said curriculum gets all of the credit. That was your term in the article. Oh, yeah. Curriculum gets all of the credit, and right now curriculum is winning. So how is that so if the teachers are the ones who have to deliver this? I think that's a that's such a that's such a great question. I think it's 
I mean, I, I candidly, I think that the folks who are mandating these curricula are just missed. They're, they're not teachers. They're not people who've spent time in schools and they've lost, they don't understand that, that teachers are not robots. Get your shears button. <laughs> Oh, cheer, cheers for what Kate just said, but I was actually picking up the other one. All right, here's cheers for no, Kate. No, don't give go. her a BS. No, wait, that for her. Cheers for Kate. I just said yes. that. <laughs> I just I, there's just such a disconnect. And 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 my biggest frustration with this with this legislation, some of which I think is so important, is it just it completely misunderstands how schools and teachers function. I don't think these mandates are actually going to be that impactful because at the end of the day, you know, you, you all know as well as I do, like I can just go close my door and do whatever the heck I want, whether that was, you know, whether that's units of study or some homespun curriculum or whether it's just put on a movie and like, and let the kids, let the kids hang. Like no one, if you don't have teacher buy-in here, it's just, this isn't, this isn't going to work. Yeah. Interesting. So, Judy, you know, um, one thing that, um, you know, you and I have spoken about um, are parents who go to IEP meetings, right? And often they are asking for a particular program. And I almost think the consensus out there, not just with teachers and administrators, but parents too that if they just get a particular program for their kids, let's say an intervention, right? Like I want, you know, the OG approach or I want Wilson or whatever they're asking for, that all their problems at that point will be solved if they just get this particular program. What do you think about that, Judy? Yeah. So it's, it's funny because I've actually um, done some of my own work with um, an ed educational attorney at some point. And the first question that the attorney asked me at some point in my life was, if I was a magical fairy, what would you wish for, for your child? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, great things happen for my own child, but that's not always the way things actually go. So going back to curriculum and we could go into with phonics curriculum and so forth. It's a little bit more straightforward. I think that, no, actually it's not, it's not straightforward. If an IEP says that the child needs an Orton Gillingham based phonics approach, and then the intervention is an intervention like LLI. And then you tell a parent that, and the parent doesn't know LLI from a hole in the wall. And they're like, oh my God, Miss Judy, my kid's getting intervention, but it's not actually the intervention that matches the IP. That's extremely problematic. So I think one of the things that reader, um, our parents can do is uh, read Faith's book. She has two books out there. One is Failing Students or Failing failing schools. And the other one is about if only if the if only series, right? About what parents should know about what we're looking for in the classroom. Because I think that's very, very a big, big piece of it. I don't know if you do this, Faith. Um, I know you have a lot of private clientele as well. I very often have to coach parents and like text them the kind of questions to ask about the literacy block and if it's aligned to the science and research and what's what it says needs to happen based on the IEP. I'm sure you're you probably are sending out similar texts and having similar conversations as well, right? Always, always. And I and I think what one of the things I do tell them, and I'm very honest, I'll say, yeah, you, you might get this particular program, but just realize that it's all about implementation. Right. And it's really about the teacher's comfort level. Sometimes Somebody's just handed a particular program. Well, like here, use it. This is what the parent asked for. And right. goes, and there you go. And there's the teacher was kind of learning along at the same time. So, you know, again, it goes back to the idea. But Faith, can I ask you something? How does that even happen? That a neuropsych report, which is a report from somebody who has a PhD, a doctorate degree, right? writes in their report that something's supposed to take place 
and then it's ignored. How is that legally even allowed to happen? You know what? Um, I think that school districts are always trying to save money in some way. And I don't want to get into the particulars. Yes. It happens. You know, it happens. It happens too often where um, parents are. It's always an uphill battle. They're always fighting. But getting back to Kata's article with um, because this is really about tier one. I really just brought that up only because it's like asking for a particular program as if the program is going to do the heavy lifting. So Kata, um, let's talk a little bit about what you had suggested in the article as far as um, ways to bring both pieces together. Could you talk a little bit about that? You had some suggestions here about how it's not just about the curriculum, it's bringing the teacher along for the ride and to make it a comfortable fit. Could you talk a bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. And I want to clarify, this is, I am I am not an implementation guru or expert. Um, you should go talk to, you know, you've already talked to Pamela Snow. There are lots of, lots of people who I've, you know, thought more deeply about this, about this really important question of, of implementation and who are actively doing, doing this work. But um, I think a couple of things that have stood out to me, you know, from talking to teachers and observing schools that I think have, have pulled this, pull, pulled off this implementation really, really effectively. Um, I think I, I identified four four different things um, that I think that really that that that, that, that kind of I think need to need to happen almost no matter no matter your context. Um, so I think first professional development that's led by actual teachers or you know or people who are using who are actively using this curriculum, right? Um, and I think I, I just at the end of the day, right? Teachers listen to other teachers. They don't want to be listening to salespeople from these companies who are coming in, um, who may have it, who may have never been in the classroom, um, or maybe they, the last time they were in the classroom, they were teaching something completely, completely different. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's, I think that's a real, I think that's really, really important. If if I were still in the classroom, I would want to be hearing from teachers who are teaching the same, the teaching the same thing that I'm being asked to implement. Um, I think Wit and Wisdom actually. Um, does does a does a pretty good job of this. They run this small fellowship program where they actually work with actual practitioners, and they and the um and and these and these practitioners who are teachers, right, travel around the country um, a few times a year, and and they and they help lead implementation efforts in other districts. It's a small program, though. If I were leading a district, I would demand whatever curricula I was I was I was adopting did something like that. Um, I, I just, that seems like a no a no brainer. Um, so that's point one. Um, point two, I think the PD has got to be practical and it can't just be theoretical. I think it's so important that teachers are equipped with that knowledge of like why they they need they they need to learn the cognitive science. But I can't tell you how many you know PD sessions I sat through as a teacher and that asking myself, but how does this make my job easier on Monday? Right. Um, I, I th in fact, I think I can count like the, the number of professional development experiences that I had that were actually like practical. I'm like one hand. And that's that's pretty pathetic. Hey, that was a really good one. How do how does this PD make my Monday look easier? I just well, I think yeah. So you know what? I could tell you um, in implementation in uh, the district where I'm doing some work as a consultant. Uh, we're using sounds right mm -hmm. and one great thing about sounds right is they have obviously the big picture but it ties right into the materials and that's something that we were talking about the other day um oh actually just with our last guest that we had on we didn't put this out yet actually um but that's coming and we talked about how um, what was it? The letters training is um, very. I am I'm still in letters training right now. And it's certainly very powerful 
but the practical piece of how does this translate to the materials I have in my room and the program that I'm using, there's a disconnect. So yep. that, that, you know, is, is and it's very long. It's a very long training. I'm, I'm doing it already. It feels like it's forever. It's like my second year. And, um, I think that when I got Orton Gillingham trained, it was 30 hours, but it right away spoke about the application piece, which for me was very, very powerful because it gave me practical tips of what I could do tomorrow in the classroom to get, you know, to start shifting the needle. I, yeah, and I've done that, Faith, I think we've talked about this before, but I've I've done that Sounds Right PD myself, and it is, I, I, I don't need to turn this into an endorsement for Sounds Right, but oh my gosh, it was by far, it was the best, prof even though it was virtual and mostly asynchronous, it was the best professional development. Wow, look at that. And I, and I would agree too, for something that was online, it was done beautifully, but I just want to also say, what you said about um, you know making this then practical in the classroom, teachers are still going to have questions. It can't just stop with a training. And right. so when I go in, I'm going in regularly, but what you said about trying to pick out teachers now as models, so I'll model it, but then when I'm looking around, I will point out, I'll say, you know what? This teacher's doing it really well. Maybe other teachers should visit. Yeah, that's capacity building first. right there. Right, tip is sustainability. So it's not all just me doing the modeling. I mean, and I do willingly, but eventually you want to see this pass on mm -hmm. to the teachers in the building. But, um, you know, and what you said about not having somebody just from a program, because you know what, somebody learns the program. And like you said, maybe they had a couple of years of teaching. Sometimes they don't want to be classroom teachers. They go right from, you know, doing like maybe a couple of years of subbing and maybe a, a year or two in the classroom. All of a sudden they're consultants, they're coaching. So they learn a program and they become a one trick pony. That doesn't work. A either. one trick pony. Faith, can I jump in for a second? Yeah. Going back in the conversation before, um, Katie, you mentioned something like the safer bet might be to, you know, for some people, especially people that are just new to certain programs, might be the safer bet. But from what I'm seeing, it's not always the case, and it depends on the curriculum. Some teachers that I know are actually um, going, sticking to the program with a, to a T, mm -hmm. using the tasks that are in the book, and then they're not getting the best, you know, evaluations because apparently some of the tasks don't well align to the standards. And then um, the task didn't always really connect to a standard. Like uh, there was a lesson that I think that I heard about recently. It was something about being able to compare two periods of time. And the only resource that was in the um, curriculum was creating a timeline. Now, creating a timeline, yes, that's a piece of it, but not really because the compare piece was totally missed. So sometimes I think there's a danger when you just do the F bomb of the fidelity piece. <laughs> um if it, you know, if every task wasn't looked at in the field or the researchers messed up or there was really no research to every task, I think you could fall into a problem as well and that comes back to you know, what is a team teacher? I'm on team teacher for that, right? Yeah, yeah. Kay, to finish um, what you were talking about, you, you, I, I interrupted you before, oh. but um, you had two points, the first two points. What were the other oh, two? Yes. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, point one, PD should be led by actual teachers. Point two, PD should be practical. You should be able to, you should be able to change, do something different on Monday if that's what you want. <laughs> <laughs> yes cheers cheers go ahead um and then and then and then and then the last two we um the for number three i think it's really important that that there be community and connections inside and outside schools and districts um around around curriculum i don't know if you all have spent time in the you fly um facebook group but i think this is one of the best examples of of that of that 
sort of as that sort of like burgeoning community. There are nearly 200,000 200, teachers wow. in the Facebook group. And it was actually, it was created by the the, the authors of Youth Flash, like Holly Lane. And, um, and, and, it's, and it's amazing because teachers come into this group. There are many of them are, you know, a, this is, this is really like their first, their first foray into, into the science of reading and structured literacy. And they get to ask all these questions. They get to share pictures of their classroom. They get to troubleshoot, troubleshoot problems they've had. They get to, they get to share success stories. And there's just this really palpable sense of community and support that exists in this in this Facebook group. Um, it doesn't hurt that you know folks like Holly Lane and people who work for her are really responsive to the to the teachers. You know, I think they they but but it, and yeah. it's it's just it's I think that can you um Kata, can you let our viewers know just for those that don't don't know what U Fly stands for, just so that they can find it. Oh gosh, yeah. Let me. So, so you fly is a foundational skills. Um, is a foundational skills curriculum. Yes, and University, University of Florida. Of Florida. I put out by University of Florida. Yeah. And I want to. I want to get the acronym right. Yeah, I got the book right when it was on early release. I like was one of the first people that got my hands on it. I love it. And University it's a very close to Florida question. Literacy Initiative. Yeah. Would that be it? I think that's, I think that's, I think that's right, but we should, yeah, I should, I, 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 it's I, pretty amazing stuff. It's pretty amazing stuff. I, I, I honestly have never seen anything more powerful than that one. Everything's there for you. The slide shows for every lesson it's cost efficient, but I don't see it in the field that much, unfortunately. It's, well, that yeah. was, um, you know, the old um, Florida, uh, reading research. Um, what yep. was it? F. Oh God, um, F C F. I used to. As R long as it's not F U, it's fine. no, it's not F U. It's <laughs> it's um, the Florida Center for Reading Research F C R R. And so you know they took this type of work that was up there for free for teachers, and then they they used the work that they were creating to come up with this manual. Um, so, and, and, you know, and that's wonderful because you could get everything for free, but the book just makes it easy to have. So, um, and it's very explicit. So, and, and so what was the last one, Kata? You mentioned community and what was- Yeah, building that community is number three. And then that last one is something we've kind of, we've already talked about, but right, that permission to deviate. I think that's probably the most the most controversial. There are lots of people mm -hmm. I respect who would say, you're crazy. Like that's that's gonna lead to lethal lethal mutations, um, right? Of like, of, of high quality instructional materials. But I think it's, I think it's both a matter of respect and it's a matter of it's it's so it's a matter it's it's a matter of respecting teachers but it's it's also just a matter of acknowledging the reality that that the the the, the, te the teachers really 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 matter and um and if we don't if we don't encourage them to use their to to, to use their expertise and their creativity and their knowledge we're holding, we're holding them back, which means we're holding, we're going to be holding students back. And when I look at our fellows, right, and our that 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 we that we support and work with every day, they're all using these comprehensive reading curricula. You know, the ones that are endorsed by the Knowledge Matters campaign, whether that's Wit and Wisdom or EL or Core Knowledge um, or Bookworms. But they're all also they've all figured out what makes them special. I think what makes them experts make some great teachers who get great results is they've all figured out ways to make that those curricula work better for them and for their students. So they're, they're bringing in inspiration and ideas from other teachers that they have developed in, you know, at past schools that they've, that they've, you know, that they've just designed, designed themselves to meet the needs of their students. And I think that's, I think that's expert teaching at its, at its finest. So here's the last point as a wrap up. So Kata, um, as we're talking, you know, I'm sure you heard of the expression to teacher proof or a full, you know, foolproof um, that the curriculum is magical in some way. And I remember also when an assistant superintendent many years ago asked me for 
a program. She was an assistant superintendent in a low performing district and wanted me to suggest something that was basically like dummy proof, teacher proof, mm -hmm. fool proof. And I say dummy proof, believe me, you know what I mean? Like that was the, the feeling that I got she was trying to get across. Like, so something that you can't mess up. My feeling is that we should look for the curriculum proof teacher. We should be trying to build a teacher who is curriculum proof, not teacher proof. What are your thoughts about that? So that a teacher could be handed anything and it won't matter, it won't rock her world or rock his world because they know this so well that it won't matter what is out there. What are your Faith, thoughts? You're on fire tonight. I got to give it to it. you. You're on fire, Faith. <laughs> I, 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 I absolutely love that. I love that framing, but I, and, I, and I think, and that's, I mean, that's, I think, I think that's what, I think that's what we, we want. And I think that would be, would be, would be a huge, I think that's, a, that's, a, that's a huge deal. But when I think, when I look at what I, but it, but unfortunately I'm so pessimistic about that, about that vision. When I look at what, states are investing in right and what what and even what you know this is the city of new york is doing right um they're by you know by 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 eliminating coaching positions right it's like they're 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 sort of they're they're tact they're they're just thinking about the problem in such a different way than than you are or 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 we are um and that's that's really that's really sad and scary to me and i think until teachers have have that have that voice um and are and and are listened to i don't i don't i don't see that changing um wow i just i realize that's extremely pessimistic so we'll have to find a better a better way to end but i'm not i don't i don't see that i don't see that happening i don't see those investments happening yeah judy it's very interesting kate had just mentioned the importance of coaching and um, how maybe, um, you know, they're looking at this through a very narrow, um, you know, a very narrow viewpoint that just getting something that's evidence-based um, will be enough. Um, and that basically the teachers will just learn and deal with it and, I I am also with her too. I'm not very optimistic because I've oh, been. Oh no! This is not my first rodeo. Okay, <laughs> you know it's like I've been down this road multiple times. Well, you know, I think that what you both are saying is a realist's point of view, and I think I'm a realist in some senses as well. You know, we expect explicit instruction for students. Where's that explicit instruction for teachers? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, and guidance and support, 100%. Do we do, you do. Right, right, gradual release for a teacher, starting with a strong model, working with that teacher, with a coach. By but the you know, you know. So coaching didn't totally disappear. A lot of principals valued coaching, um, and there are many in-house coaches. There are also many coaches that still do work for Central. It's just a totally different model. There's just, the support looks different right now. And I think that many people are probably feeling the effects of that. But it's very hard. Like, you know, we're just the people in the field. We 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 do what we're told, right? Yeah. Today you're a coach. Tomorrow you're a, a interventionist. Today you're a coach tomorrow you're back in the classroom you know yeah it's it that's the way it goes so Kata, did we leave anything out that you would like to add gosh um i think we i think we did a i think you guys did a great job of walking walking through the article i think i mean i i think but i don't i don't want to end on such a such a negative pessimistic note um so i think i think the la the last thing i would say like while i i I am pessimistic um, to some extent about the way various states and various districts and various cities are approaching, you know, are, are approaching this 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 implementation. I do think there are lots of bright spots out there. There are a lot mm -hmm. of wonderful teachers 
There are a lot of wonderful districts. There are a lot of wonderful schools. There are a lot of wonderful principals and coaches who are doing who are doing this work on a more micro level, and I think doing it really effectively. And I think the extent to which we can find those models and hold them up and learn from them and study them and ask them a million questions, I think we'll all be so much better better for it. Um, and I think when I get when I get like negative and pessimistic about about this work. That's what that's what I try to that's what I try to go do is I try to find those try to find those bright spots um, and 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 they and they're and they're just so there's so many of them out there um, but sometimes they're just so busy teaching kids how to read that you know they don't they're not on they're not always on your radar um, so I think I think that's you know I think if I think that's I think that's a really important thing for all of us in the field in the field to do go find those bright spots and elevate them and learn from them um because there's they're they're out there um, they, are out there. Yeah. they certainly are out there Judy any last thoughts that we didn't touch on that you would like to add yeah I, I definitely want to thank Kata for being with us today uh Faith you said she's amazing and brilliant and I'm so excited to continue to follow the work that she's doing out in the field. I hope to see more articles from you and to get to know you better because it's a delight to not just hear from the same old, same old folks. It's great to hear from different voices and see different people that are really trying to make an impact out there. So I really thank you, Kata. And then one other thing is um, we didn't mention Lucy in this episode. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> but I think, you know, you know, the evidence and research is now showing that so many things were wrong. But the one thing I think that she did get right is that embedded coaching. Teachers yeah. felt supported. There was somebody there every week. There was somebody modeling on the carpet. There was somebody modeling lessons. Now, of course, we don't want modeling that looked the same, but I think that's a very imp important piece of the work. And um, yeah, let's give our teachers the level of support they need. And let's also hear more from them. You know, mm -hmm. we put so many mandates on our teachers, do this, do that, do this, do that. But how often are we saying, hey, how are you doing? What's going well for you? What's not going well? Yeah. What, what level of support do you need? Yeah. yeah. yeah and that's... just, you know, also give them the grace of time. There's a learning curve and, you know, don't, don't judge. Don't, you know, just be supportive. They need... The teachers need some loving right now. And there's a major teacher shorting. Why the hell is anybody want to go, going to want to go into this profession if there is no level of support, if there is no positivity? So, you know, let's give our teachers the love and support that they deserve. Yeah. And, you know, I just want to end also by thanking Kata. Um, Kata and I have spoken before this podcast and I did say that, Kata, you are brilliant and you're just um, forward thinking. And uh, the work that you're doing with your foundation is groundbreaking. And you're right. We, we do need that type of work, those models, those visual models of people actually doing the work, not just someone talking about it, but actually doing the work with real kids and how does this look? Um, we, we owe it to teachers to, to give them that type of support. So I thank you also. This has been great. Your article was super right to the point. And um, we'll put the link in the show notes. So okay. people can get in touch with Kata's organization to get a level of support? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All Absolutely. over Kata? Everywhere? Yeah, I mean, so we, so right now, our, 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 what our foundation, our, our main project at the foundation is we pay expert literacy teachers to, to film themselves teaching reading. And then we try to get that content in front of other teachers who want to learn, whether that's on Twitter or Facebook. And one day, TikTok and Instagram, those, those platforms terrify me. Um, so, oh my God, that sounds familiar, right, Faith? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not that. I, I'm. I, I'm not. I, I'm not part of. I'm a millennial. I'm not. I'm not a Gen Zer. So, um, if anyone has any advice about um, social media, they should also get in touch. But that's. Yeah. That's. That's. That's really our mission right now. Is, and I think it's really important. Compensating teachers for sharing their expertise with with others is really is really what we're we're all about. Um, oh. 
Cool. So that is the Goyen Foundation. So, all right, Judy, let's wrap it up. Hit it, honey. Go to All it. right. So <laughs> follow us on Facebook, Real Teachers Letting Loose the Literacy View. Follow us on Instagram, the Literacy View. Follow Faith on her private Instagram at High Five Literacy. Follow me on my private one at Boxner Judy. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Literacy View. And also, you could find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, The Literacy View. Give us a review. Also, tell your teacher friends about us. Tell your administrators about us. Tell your parent friends. We and want share, share, more share. sharing. Sharing is caring. Sharing. Thank you, everyone. And okay. thank you, Kata. It was an awesome night. Yeah, I, I definitely know. don't feel sleepy anymore. Now no, I want to. I want to get to know you better. I feel like I I found a new friend tonight. Likewise. Yeah. All right, we'll talk. Thank you. Thank you, guys.